I don't know how I'm going to follow Zach. So, um, man. Yeah, that was that was powerful. Thankfully, this is uh, this is not that kind of talk. So, um, I titled this. Um, this is more the fun part from the from the part one. Uh, this is more the overall. Sorry, that may be loud. Uh, kind of on philosophy, basically. You know, that's a big word and. Sorry, this word is not what I'm talking about. I titled this navel gazing just because that's what I think philosophy kind of is. You kind of just staring at your navel a lot. Um, apparently, thanks to uh, Gary Cole, he, he let me know that the, the Greek term is omphaloskepsis, and that actually means navel gazing. So uh, I had to throw that in here for that. So kudos to Gary for that. Um, you know, this is kind of what most people think about, right? Like. Stare at your belly button and ask questions. Um, you know, when you think of the word philosophy, people think about Greek statues. They think about the Greeks. They think about Socrates. Um, I think a lot of people think philosophy is kind of uh, silly, um, or they just don't understand it. But philosophy, everybody is a philosopher, even if you don't know it. Okay, Everybody philosophizes about things, if that's even a, a verb. Um, we all, again, it goes back to thinking, like we talked about in the first one. We all think about things a certain way, and we apply what we believe to our life. And that's essentially what philosophy is. Philosophy is just, it's a special branch of thinking. And I'll kind of go through different parts of it. I'm not going to get in the weeds. I'm not a philosopher. A philosopher might watch me give this and might make fun of me. That's okay. This is sort of my summary of things I've learned. I've been, I've been reading this stuff since early 2000s. And it just it gets easier the more you read it and the more um, you kind of start incorporating a lot of other things you learn in life to see the bigger picture. But um, it took me a long time, I feel like, to grasp what... And a lot of these guys talk about stuff that I don't understand, and I'm okay with that. Um, but basically, why does philosophy matter? Because it affects everything. Every single thing in life is affected by your philosophy and your worldview, Right? Whether it's dealing with wars, whether it's you believe that the Pope is God on earth, whatever, whether you're pledging allegiance to a state, whether you crucify somebody for a certain reason, whether you take an injection because you're told to, whatever it is, you have a philosophy, uh, baseline beliefs about things that cause you to then act on those. And that's a huge deal. Um, you know, as Christians, I feel like our philosophy should be based on Scripture. And I'll go through why I think that is here in a minute. Because um, not all Christians believe that. Um, they might pay lip service to it, but they don't actually fully believe it. Um, and that plays out a lot of times in things they support and things they believe, and you know, whether it's political stuff or other things. Um, philosophy really matters. Um, it, it's foundational. Um, and so, I, I, like I said, I think, I think our baseline philosophy should be based on Scripture, and I'll go through that. The etymology of the word philosophy just means love of wisdom, which sounds great, right? We all love wisdom. Uh, you can read through the Proverbs to read it about wisdom. Um, Oxford Dictionary, study of the nature and the meaning of the universe and human life. Like, wow, that's everything, right? Like, that's the study of everything. Um, Cambridge, the use of reason, we're back to logic, in understanding such things as the nature of the real world and the existence use and limits of knowledge, and the principles of moral judgment. And that's kind of the big gist of philosophy is you really hone in on knowledge. What is knowledge? Can we know anything at all? How do we know anything at all? And ethics, right? That's a, the, a huge component of philosophy is ethics. And if you could get into reading different philosophers, especially non-Christian philosophers, on their theories of ethics, it's astounding. It's kind of terrifying because they don't have a standard for their ethic. And so most of their ethics, you know, turns into utilitarianism and pragmatism, and it's all about subjective feeling, whatever achieves uh, no pain and pleasure. Like, that's, that's an ethic that some people, an ethical system some people have. We can't get very far with that. Um, but, you know, you start asking questions, and that's what philosophers really do, is they ask questions about, am I really in a real world, right? You get into that whole, are we in a simulation? I mean, you could go nuts with this stuff, and you'll drive yourself in circles, you know, doing it. Um, because it, it always goes back to that, like I was telling you earlier about how as a kid I'd ask, but why, but why, but why? In philosophy, the, the word is, or the phrase is always, well, how do you know that? And then somebody says something, you go, but how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? And you, you, you have to figure out how you don't go in an infinite regress. How do you not keep going backwards? What is your starting point that you can know anything at all? 
and that's, that's what we get to here in a minute. Um, but I, I just love this subject because, especially in Christian apologetics, right? Um, there's, a, there's a side of Christian apologetics that a lot of you may not know about, and, and some guys do. It's called like presuppositional apologetics. Presuppositional meaning we start with belief in Scripture and we reason from there. And apologetics is about giving a defense for your faith. This is not what this talk is about, but it would still apply to that. Epistemology, which I'll talk about in a minute, is the study of knowledge. That's how do you know anything. A lot of people conflate the theory of knowledge with defending the faith, and they're not the same thing. Um, so I think that's something to, to point out up front, because I used to confuse those quite a bit, and it would, it would lead me in a lot of circles. Um, so this is kind of an interesting quote from a non-Christian, uh, still a useful quote about what philosophy is, because it, it's hard to define. But this seems to be a pretty good summary. It, philosophy, its business is to analyze fundamental concepts such as self, matter, mind, good, truth, to examine fundamental assumptions such as that all events have causes, and to fit the conclusions together into a coherent view of nature and man's place in it. Notice that last part there in italics. We get back to the uh, fashioning a story that works. That's what coherent means. And that's what you end up seeing in most of philosophy is men, mainly, back in the old days especially, sitting around trying to come up with stories to explain the world, whether it's explain morality or explain beauty or aesthetics, uh, the meaning of life. Like, that's the deepest thing anybody asks, right, is why am I here? What is my purpose? Well, if you don't have revelation, if you don't have a, a, your creator telling you why you're here, you come up with as many stories as you want, and that's what they do, and that's what they've done. Um, and it's, I think that's the fun part. Once you see it for what it is, then you can kind of read and you can still learn things from all these people. If you don't have the foundation, I'd say, from Scripture, you can, you can get sucked down a lot of these paths pretty, pretty easy um, because they tickle the ears, right? They sound good to a lot of people. Um, I like this quote from John Robbins, who's part of, uh, like I said, a big inspiration for these talks, is every man may not have a systematic philosophy, but every man makes certain assumptions about the world, about himself, and about God. And that's true. You know, we all do that. Um, Nietzsche said philosophy was simply the love of one's own wisdom, which is kind of true. People like to make up their own stories and proclaim that those are how the world really is. Um, Victor Hugo called philosophy the microscope of thought, which I thought was pretty cool, especially going back to the previous talk on thinking is you, you're thinking about your thoughts, right? You're thinking about thinking and why you think the thoughts that you do. Um, and Blaise Pascal, who was, um, you know, was, a, was a Christian, um, he said, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars. Certainty, certainty, feeling, joy, peace. He understood that the philosophers of his time, the secular philosophies, they had, had nothing. They held no candle against God, the God of Scripture. And I just thought that was a pretty powerful quote. Um, but men love telling tales, so that was kind of, again, going back to what I was saying. And, and you see it in Scripture, right? Paul, you know, they, they outline it right here. Um, they took him and brought him to, is it Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you're proclaiming. These are like the philosophers hanging around. And for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. And then they explain why they wanted to know. All the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Tales. Telling tales, right? Like, that's what, that's what people do. And this ties in, again, I can't separate it from the first talk, about sitting around and drumming up stories, you know, for, you know, in, in, in my East Texas slang, for why things are the way they are, man. You know, you go, you go down to the local diner, and there's going to be somebody in there, and you start talking about something, and they're, let, let me tell you why that's the way it is. And they, they'll spin a tale, and you go, okay, that sounds cool. They don't, they don't know. You know. They might, but a lot of times they don't. They're just making it up. But that's, it's just funny that that's, this is nothing new. This is human nature to sit around and, and talk about things um, without knowing. You know. And that's fine as long as you, you know that that's what you're doing. But these guys didn't do that. These philosophers made up elaborate philosophies and they, they get into textbooks and now we study them like they're these viable options for you know how to think about life. It's really fascinating. Um, this was another one from Gordon Clark and he's one of my heroes. That's why I quote a lot from him. Um, 
I just thought he was, he's, he was wrong on a lot of things, and he's right on a lot of things. But I love this quote. The reason that philosophy is so important in understanding a civilization, the reason why, therefore, philosophy is essential to anyone who wishes to influence society is simply that, on the whole, philosophy controls the thoughts of men. People may not be aware of the factors which influence their thinking. They may never have heard of the world's greatest thinkers, but over a period of time, the theories of philosophers are popularized, publicized, and are then incorporated in the thinking of ordinary citizens. This is so true because think about most of the things we have learned, especially if we went to public school in the United States, right? You're learning philosophy without knowing it. Um, you're learning the philosophies mainly of secular, atheist, uh, empiricist philosophers, like John Dewey and a lot of these people that, you know, if you truly knew what they taught and the fallacies involved, I think most of us would go, most of us would probably pull their kids out of the schools, honestly. I mean, it's, it's actually pretty terrifying to think about. But once you at least, you know, let's say, I'm not, I'm not knocking that because I know that people just have to do that in this day and age. And some, it's just be aware that this is there. Um, and the secular side will hound you again, you know, over this if you try to even challenge any of this stuff. But, and that's fine. Just recognize that these things being pushed as facts are mainly philosophies and religions that are being pushed on you and pushed, pushed on all of us. And, and you know, it's what it is. We're in competing religions at that point. Um, we'll get to, you know, the Christianity part. Um, but there's sub-disciplines in philosophy. The main one that I'm talking about today is epistemology. Epistemology, again, is the, the theory of knowledge. How do you know anything at all? How do you justify knowing anything at all? Metaphysics, I don't really, it's sort of the above the physics is, is well, Aristotle called it that, meaning like, what's the nature of reality that's not all the physical stuff? What's behind it? You know, we would say, well, there's a supernatural world behind it that God controls, right? Um, but metaphysics is just sort of, above physics in, in, in that sense. Ethics, we all know what ethics is, is morality. Um, not all people agree with that. There are secular philosophers now that, that say, no, ethics is not, and we learned that in med school. They'd say, you know, we'd have these medical ethics courses, and they'd be like, now don't confuse this with morality. And it was just mind-boggling to me. Like, you're trying to make right and wrong claims, but you're saying it's not morality. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you, ethics, by, by definition, involves morality, I think. Um, politics, I would say, falls under uh, ethics, in my opinion. Um, economics actually does as well. Um, and so th that's, those are some subdisciplines. Sometimes you'll see art under, under some philosophies and aesthetics and things like that. Um, but I like epistemology. Um, I like Mark Twain here. Ain't, ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Um, you know. <laughs> Of course, I could, I could be a pedantic jerk if I, if I could meet Mark Twain and go, well, how do you know that, you know? <laughs> um, but I still liked it. It's, it's the things that you think you know for sure, but you really have no clue, and you just start spouting those as facts, and you, you end up going down a lot of trails that, if you're not honest, you can't get out of without swallowing swall your pride. Um, but he always had some good ones. Um, I like this one just because Kelly Moody posted it on Facebook, and I just thought it was hilarious when it comes to philosophy. If anyone has any experience with anything or knows anything about something, please let me know. Just <laughs> anything, you know. But I thought that was funny. So epistemology is how do you know anything, okay? That's, you'll see this term thrown around sometimes in certain Facebook chats and things like that, or people say, you know, you need to work on your epistemology or whatever. I use the term a lot, and I realize I think sometimes people have no idea what the word means, and it's... It's silly to even use it all the time, but it's kind of fun, too. Um, but basically, this is the essence of epistemology is how do you know that? And again, I told you, if you want to tick somebody off, start asking them this question. How do you know that? And people will ask you that, right, as Christians. They'll ask you, how do you know about the, that the Bible is the Word of God? How do you know this, this, and this? We'll get to that. Um, but you have to understand this would not exist if this was not an issue. If everything was just easy to truly know, you would not have this field of epistemology where people over how many thousands of years can't even agree as to how you can know anything or if you can know anything at all, okay? It's a big deal. It's just most of us don't lay around at night in our beds going, well, how do I know that? How do I know that? I do. I'm a weirdo. Um, <laughs> And, and, and you can get very, I, I used to get, you, you almost become a skeptic about it. You could go down that nihilistic skeptic route if you question everything to the point where, like Rene Descartes, which I'll bring up later, you know, we, we all kind of know that saying, I think, therefore I am. That was Descartes' foundational 
That's the only thing he thought he could know with, without any doubt was that he existed. The problem with that is, where do you go from there? If that's your only foundation that you exist, but you can't know anything else, you're locked in your mind. You're locked into, it's called solipsism, which is only I exist and everything else is just a construct of my imagination. Well, that's, nobody lives their life like that. You know, that would be pretty interesting if they did uh, or terrifying. So, um, but you could get into that level of skepticism if you constantly ask how you know what you know. Um, I put in here like the, the root terms, episteme means knowledge, lo logia means logical discourse. So it's the logical discourse of knowledge. How do we know what we know? That's all epistemology means. Um, a lot of people just come up with theories about this, meaning they don't, they come up with stories. You've got to define knowledge first, right? What does that even mean? We're all back to definitions here. Um, Bertrand Russell, again, atheist, um, but he, he did a lot of work in philosophy. And he said, philosophy arises from an unusually obstinate attempt to arrive at real knowledge. Notice that, just notice the, the words he uses in his assumptions already. What passes for knowledge in ordinary life suffers from three defects. It's cocksure, vague, and self-contradictory. Pretty true. So notice what, what's he's going to do to replace it. The first step towards philosophy consists in becoming aware of these defects. Good. Not in order to rest content with a lazy skepticism. Good. But in order to substitute an amended kind of knowledge, which shall be tentative, precise, and self-consistent. That sounds kind of good on the surface, but it's not, right? Like, amended kind of knowledge is tentative. Knowledge is not tentative. True knowledge is truth. That's how I think of knowledge anyway, is infallible truth that cannot be possibly wrong. Well, again, I'll get to why I think that can only come from Scripture, but he's resting with a tentative knowledge that may be precise even though it's not true and self-consistent, which we're getting back to, I'm going to make my story work. That's what that means. Anytime you see that self-consistent term or coherent, they'll say you, you, your, your system needs to be coherent. That's true. Just because a system's coherent doesn't mean it's true. Um, if it's incoherent, it's wrong. So it's sort of like you can know it's wrong by the fact, that, and I, I say that a lot on Facebook to people. If your worldview causes you to commit contradictions, you have the wrong worldview. That's just that simple. There's something wrong in your worldview if you're contradicting yourself somewhere. Um, so that's a good test of a worldview to see if it's legitimate or illegitimate. It's not a good test to see if it's true or not. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, but I thought that was interesting. Um, Gordon Clark, again, another one. While the question of how, how we can know God is the fundamental question of the philosophy of religion, there lies behind it in general philosophy the ultimate question, epistemology, how can we know anything at all? We're back to that. If we cannot talk intelligently about God, can we talk intelligently about morality, ideas, art, politics? Can we even talk about science? How can we know anything? The answer to this question, technically called the theory of epistemology, controls all subject matter claiming to be intelligible or cognitive. So this is sort of like the mothership of philosophy, is how do you know anything? Um, knowledge is a belief, but not just any belief. This is Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Knowledge is always a true belief, but not just any true belief. It's a confident, although hopelessly uninformed belief as to which horse will win or even has won. A particular race is not knowledge, even if the belief is true. Knowledge is always a well-justified true belief, any well-justified true belief. So this is what you usually see if you ever look up the philosophical definition of knowledge. They'll say it's justified true belief. And you're like, that's a mouthful. But it kind of makes sense. Okay, for me to know it, I have to believe it. So it has to be a belief. We, we equate belief with like a, being a naughty word, and it's not. Um, but the, the issue becomes true. Okay, how do you test for it to be true or not? How do you know if something's true? And then how do you know if it's justified? Like, what's your justification for your knowledge claim? Like, how did you get there, right? And again, the problem with this is how do you avoid the, the regress? How do you know that? Well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know your justification is good? How do you know that justified? You can't ever escape it unless you start somewhere. Um, which I think is kind of fascinating. I looked this up in 2004. I came across this. I made a Facebook post about it, and I lost it. I can't find it. So I finally found just a schematic. It's called Agrippa's or Munchausen's Trilemma. And so the issue with this is, again, to avoid infinite regress on the left, meaning how do you know that? How do you know that? You keep going back in time forever. 
you can either go with on the right, circularity. Okay, I know A is true because B is true. Well, how do you know B is true? B is true because A is true. Well, then you're just arguing in a circle, and that's not really... Some people are okay with that. I, I will say, and I'm not trying to ruffle feathers on this, there's a, there's a group of um, reform philosophy, uh, more like Van Til, Greg Bonson's side, that seem to be okay with circularity. The Gordon Clark School of Thought were up in the middle at the top, and, and, then, and that's called foundationalism. So what, what foundationalism, it's like geometry, okay? Foundationalism means you have to start somewhere with your reasoning. You have to pick. You can't, you can't know, you can't justify your starting point because if you could, that would be your starting point, right? You're always going to go backwards and backwards in time to try to figure out where to start from, but you can't get there. That's the infinite regress. So to avoid that, you either go with circular reasoning or you just start with a foundational axiom. Like geometry starts with axioms, and then you have theorems derived from those axioms. We all learned that in high school. So that's, what, that's, that's where Gordon Clark comes in, right? And that's where, I mean, any kind of foundational epistemology, if you look it up, even atheists you know, understand this, they'll just go with a different starting point, but they choose their starting point just like we do. And so that's the key to this, is to understand that to even get off the ground with reasoning and, and justifying how you can know anything, you have to start somewhere. Um, the question is, is your starting point coherent? Um, I would say, as Christians, our foundational axiom should be the truths of Scripture. Like, th those should be our starting point, that, that this is God's Word revealed to men. Um, and you can deduce a lot of things from there. A lot of people have problems with that, and I'll talk about it later, but I, I, that's, that's where I'm going with this. Um, I'll keep moving here. Foundationalism, again, you start with one and you go down. Coherentism is another type of circularity. It's like if your system is coherent, then it's okay. You can make a lot of systems coherent. That doesn't make them true. And then infinitism is the infinite regress. So that's just another way to look at that right there. Um, some of this stuff, you know, there, there's, there's schools of philosophy. These would be the big three, right? Skepticism, there's Greek skeptics. Those are the guys that sat around, contemplated their navels, not knowing if they even exist, existed. Okay, that's what the skeptics were. Rationalists, which came along kind of later, but you know, Plato was in there. Rationalists believe that you can learn, know anything just by logic alone. Well, we talked about that last time, right? Logic doesn't furnish you any actual premises. It's just a way to think. So they have issues there. Empiricism would be what I would call the common sense American philosophy. Uh, and it sounds really good on the surface, but there's a lot of problems with it. And I focus mainly on that because I would say most Christians today fall into that camp without understanding the issues with it. And so I harp on that more than anything, uh, at least in people that I, I talk with. Um, but empiricism essentially is the belief that all or most knowledge is derived from sensation alone. Um, which, of course, that belief is not derived from, from sensation alone, right? So it's already kind of self-defeating because no sensation told them that all or most knowledge is derived from sensation. So you're kind of starting off on a little bit of the wrong foot, but you grant them, okay, you start there. Um, Aristotle was a famous one. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who became the favorite philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church, is still today, I mean, their favorite philosopher. He was a, he tried to blend... <sighs> I don't know, Plato with, he tried to blend the Bible with Aristotle, essentially. Um, and you, you guys can go read all these if you want to. You don't have to know the writings of these people at all. Um, it's just interesting if you get into it. David Hume was a Scottish philosopher. He was not a Christian. And David Hume, if you can go through and read any of his stuff, he went through logically, okay, I'm going to start with empiricism, sensory experience. By the end, he became pure skeptic because... He understood that to take sensory experience alone would mean that all he ever knows is perceptions, but there's no way to check what he's perceiving against the real world. Like, if everything's subjective in here, how do I know that there's any real world out there? And he, he basically showed that empiricism just leads to pure skepticism. Um, and a lot of people don't think about it like that, but it just makes sense. If you can't really know the real from the perceived, how do you, then you're lost. You just don't know. Um, the problem with empiricism, okay, and a lot of people, again, this, it's, it's crazy to say this because I used to just be, I used to be this guy. I was reading all the stuff. I'd read archaeology books. I loved all the history stuff. I read, um, you know, 
Hugh Ross and all the old earth, the Christian old earth stuff, and they make all these cool arguments. It's just garbage. It just really is. And I hate to say that because there's so many epistemological issues with appealing to evidences and things like that. But sensation doesn't give you any information, right? I'm looking at y'all right now, and if I didn't have knowledge of where I am, that you're human beings, all those things is, is in here, and I was just staring, well, that, there's no information there at all. I have to interpret sensations that come in. I have to interpret a smell. If I didn't know what a chocolate chip cookie was, then I wouldn't know a certain smell was, I'm smelling a chocolate chip cookie, right? And that's, that makes sense when you say it like that, but a lot of people kind of forget that. They think you can just learn by just sheer osmosis of sens sensory input, and it just doesn't work like that. Because think about it, how do I know, even by looking right now at you guys, how do I know that that's a person right there and not to blend that person with that person and then make that a person, right? How do I know that? Well, you just, it's already here. I know it sounds crazy, um, but you, you, you never think about this stuff until you really dive deep and you go, but sensation doesn't tell me anything. I need knowledge. I need a mind to interpret the world. It goes back to the painting thing earlier. If this is too stupid. Um, if I see a picture and I don't know anything, about it. If I don't know, have any knowledge at all of anything, could I look at a picture and interpret it? No, because I don't have any information in my mind to do that. Um, so that's the problem with, with empiricism. And, and it doesn't mean we can't sort of know that there's an external world. It means that I can't justify knowledge by sensation alone. I think it's a combination, personally. Um, but they, they claim, you know, they only believe evidence. That's what an empiricist will tell you. But then you get into the whole, well, what's your evidence for evidence, right? What is the evidence that evidence tells you anything? And you end up in another infinite regress. So that, I'll leave that alone just because it's, it's kind of mind-numbing. But it's just important to understand that a lot of people make these claims without really thinking through what they're saying. Um, but this is popular, and a lot of Christian, more like the free will churches, they'll go for like the Lee Strobel Case for Christ books. I mean, I used to love all that stuff where they, they give you these quote-unquote evidences but you, if you just think about it for a minute, and I'm not knocking using historical examples. We do it with Josephus and all these things, right? Problem is this. If somebody appeals to history, you go, how do you know that that's real? How do you know that? Why do you believe that historian? Well, what, what does it come down to? It comes down to you're having faith that that person is being reliable. So, and that's where you can kind of catch these people that say, oh, I don't have faith. I know things. You go, oh, really? Well, how do you know that that history happened? You weren't there. And then they kind of go, well, well, you know, they'll, they'll call you a name or something like that. But um, it's, very, it's very enlightening uh, to see that happen. And I say it a lot on Facebook because somebody will bring these, these historical claims up. And I'll go, you, you don't know what your neighbor next door did three days ago. And you couldn't prove it if you wanted to. But you're going to try and talk about things that happened thousands of years ago based on what somebody did or didn't write. You don't know any of that. And we're talking about knowledge here. I'm not talking about opinion. I'm not talking about belief. I'm talking about knowledge. Infallible, can't be wrong. That, that can't apply to any of this stuff, right? Because you could be wrong, because you're interpreting the world. You're interpreting data. Um, so that's kind of why empiricism as a foundational structure doesn't work. It just doesn't. Um, Anyway, but a lot of the Reformed people do appeal to this, too, with Romans 1. They'll say, oh, see, Romans 1 teaches that man can look at the creation and know God. It's like, Romans 1 does not say that at all. Romans 1, literally, I have it in here, says God showed it to them. He revealed things to the, whoever these people were, if you want to say they're the Jews, or if you want to say it's, it's all mankind, that knew, they knew God's precepts. They knew certain things deserved the death penalty. That comes from revelation from God telling them that. I don't look at a mountain and understand that I deserve to die if I murder a human being. I, I get no information from looking at nature like that. If I already know about God and nature, then I can look at the world and, and just praise God for it. But I can't, without that starting point of revelation from God, nothing that I look at tells me anything. It sure doesn't give me any morality. You can't get morality from looking at things. Uh, it just doesn't work like that. But, you know, I, I don't like the whole Romans 1 appeal, but a lot of, a lot of the reform crowd used that. Um, and I just, I don't, David's talked about this before, too, in, in some of his sermons, that, you know, God has to reveal these things. Um, 
But basically, like I said earlier, the empirical philosophy ends in only I exist and no, there's no other world out there. Well, that, that kind of falters. Um, but that's what Robin said. There's no way of getting outside one's perceptions. You're locked into a prison. It starts by promising you the world, and then it locks you inside your own mind. And that's true uh, if you take things to their logical ends. But that, that's a pretty sad place to be. Um, there is a difference between empiricism and evidentialism. I'm not going to get on that. The is versus ought. So I want, this is an important one, if, if anything. You'll see people that aren't Christians, and you're talking about morality, and they'll start th saying things about natural, uh, natural law, right? They'll say God, you know, nature's law, natural law. We know what they mean by that. We usually mean private property rights and things like that, but it's a misnomer because you can't get laws of uh, morality by looking at nature. And David Hume, Scottish atheist, he was the biggest one to point this out. You cannot get an ought claim from an is, right? It, it, me looking around at the world and saying, I see this, I see this, this exists, this is, but I, I can't get an, well, that ought to be, or that person ought not to do that just by looking. I have to have be given a code, a moral code to know whether something's right or wrong. And that kind of, that goes to a lot of different things as well other than morality. But I, I think that's one of the coolest things when I first recognize that because people will appeal to history. They do this all the time, like, well, see, so-and-so thought this, and these people thought that. It's like you're describing what people have done. How does any of that have anything to do with what people ought to be doing? Tell me why I should or shouldn't be doing a certain thing. That's ethics. Um, you can't get that from just looking at stuff or describing history. You can't get there. You never can. Um, but there's no justification for knowledge and empiricism. Um, but you can believe whatever you want. Um, you know, I wrote that the, when I made this, you know, Maggie was in the bed that morning, my dog. Uh, I said, I may believe and even innately know that I saw a dog in my bed this morning, but can I justify that belief? And then you still, well, that's stupid. Of course there was a dog in your bed this morning. But if, again, philosophers are going to go, but did I really, well, how do I know that? So don't, I don't, I don't want you to end up in that skeptic trap, but I just want you to understand that's, that's where all this comes from, uh, essentially. Um, but this whole blank mind, you know, I think it was John Locke that came up with the tabula rasa, that the mind when we're born is just blank slate, and that the world imprints everything on that slate, which doesn't make sense because a mind, by definition, needs to be conscious. And if it's conscious, it's conscious of something, therefore it can't be blank. Um, my personal belief is that God endows us with all these categories of knowledge in our head. I, I think we already know. I think Adam, when he was made, I think he knew a lot of things. Um, I think he knew his name. I think he knew, you know, right from wrong. Um, that's just what I, I, that's my belief on that uh, at this point. But I do think that we have these categories in our mind. If you think about this, again, I know this stuff is esoteric, but like, think about cat. If I say the word cat, do you guys, y'all all know what a cat is. Are you thinking about any particular cat right now when you say cat? I mean, you might be, but do you have to? Do people need to think of a specific horse to know what a horse is, or do you just already know what it is in your mind? And that's sort of where you get into some of these a priori categories of, of thought that people think exist. And that's where Plato comes in and all that. Um, I don't want to keep belaboring the point on empiricism. Uh, I just want people to understand that sensory input alone cannot justify knowledge. It's just not possible. Rationalism would be the alternative meaning logic, basically, but in philosophy, rationalism is the epistemological view that regards reason as the chief source and test of knowledge. Okay, what's the problem with that? L logic can be a test for those things, but it doesn't provide you any starting points. You ha again, go back to Descartes, um, who said, he said, I'm going to get rid of everything that I've ever been taught that I can't prove, and I'm going to go with what I can only know, and he came into I exist. That was it. But again, if all you know is you exist, but you can't know anything else in the world, you still can't get anywhere from there. You can't get ethics. You can't get a, a knowledge of God, of your creator. You just can't get there. And these guys all came up, and, and Augustine was a Christian, but he's a Christian rationalist, and Descartes was a Christian. Um, and that's the, the cool thing is he did eventually appeal to Scripture because he, he understood he had to. But these other guys, Spinoza, Leibniz, the, these guys came up with these elaborate systems to try to justify knowledge and they always sort of faltered. And so it's just interesting if you kind of get into that stuff and read it. Um, but I'm not going to go through a lot of those guys. Um, what does it mean for us? That's sort of the gist of this. I just needed to get the foundational stuff down. But 
I think personally foundationalism, meaning we have to choose an axiom, that seems to be the most sensible way to avoid infinite regress or arguing in a circle. I think we have to choose a starting point, an unproven axiom. It, has, it cannot be proven because if it could be proven, that, became, that would become your axiom, right? You, you, you have to start somewhere. Um, empiricists choose sensation. Rationalists choose logic. Well, what does a Christian choose? Scripture. We cannot be faulted for this from non-believers because they do the same thing. They just don't admit it. That's the whole point of all this, is that when somebody comes to you and starts arguing about the validity of the Bible, historical validity, all this stuff, how do you know? And you start asking them how they know anything, you'll quickly find out that they've never thought about this. They've never thought about how they can justify how they know anything at all. Most of them will appeal to sensation and say, I just know it because I experienced it. That's not how it works. You, you, you're missing so many steps there on, on this level. So it's, that's why I call it sort of the common sense uh, uh, philosophy that people, because it sort of makes sense on the surface, but deep down it doesn't really flesh out. But I, I feel that Christians, they cannot fault us for choosing Scripture. You just can't. And so I don't feel the need to say, well, I can prove the Bible. Well, you can't prove the Bible. How could you do that? How do you prove, how do you prove anything from history? Um, how do you prove the existence of the, the God of the Bible? Are you going to stand above the God of the Bible to prove? Like, how would that work? It doesn't even make sense. And so when a lot of these people put us on the spot like that and, and they kind of catch you off guard with saying, well, you've got to prove to me that God exists. It's like, how would I do that? That's a category error. He's, he's immaterial, you know, first of all. But how would I prove that to you? And would you accept it as proof even if I tried? You know, that's the other thing you have to ask. Um, but this is what scripturalism is what Gordon Clark called this philosophy, was start, your starting point is scripture. This was a guy I found on the Puritan board. Puritan board was a forum, been around a long time. And I used to read this guy when I was younger, and I had no idea what he was talking about. And I came back across this a couple months ago and started rereading some of this guy's comments, and they just all clicked. And I was like, man, I think I'm finally understanding some of this stuff. Um, but I thought this was good. Take any philosophical system and ask, how do you know? Okay, that's what we've been talking about. It will always be circular or have a clear axiom or infinite regress. The results are the same. You can't start from nothing, so you must start with something. That something is the axiom of the system. You must assume the axiom is true to check to see if the system is coherent. If the axiom leads to contradictions, it's incoherent, you throw it away. If you assume the axiom is false, you cannot check the system is coherent. But you cannot prove your axiom. You can't prove your starting point. Geometry can't prove the starting axioms. They're fundamental. You start there, and then you work from there. And so the Christian does this. And you know, I'm not going to deny that it's just some willy-nilly choice that you make arbitrarily. Um, I think we would say that's where the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes in, to you just know that the Bible is the Word of God. You just do. You read it, and you know it. Um, you, can't, you can't really describe that to a non-believer. They don't, they don't really understand it. They want proofs. They want reasons to believe. And there's nothing wrong with giving defenses um, of the Scripture, and defenses are not the same as this. They, they work together, but you can give a defense using some of the evidential stuff or some of those things, or you can argue against their systems that way. But as far as proving your system true, nobody can prove it true. Um, because you have to start with something unproven, what, what, whatever it is. And I think this sets wrong with a lot of people. Um, but if you really think hard on it, I don't know how you avoid it. At least, I mean, I'm open to being corrected on this. Um, and this is not saying that we can't have knowledge about other things or at least a tentative opinion about the world. Clark was very, and this bothered me about Gordon Clark early on because I'm like, he, somebody asked him if he even knew he was married to his wife. And he's like, do I know it? He's like, she could be a clone, you know? <laughs> That's true, right? Like, how do you know? How do you know she wasn't replaced? You know, is that stupid? Probably. His point was, only from God's revelation can I know something without a doubt. No shred of doubt in my mind. It is true because the only truth giver told it to us. And that, that, is, that is what we're getting at here, is that Scripture is our starting point. We have to make it that important. We, we have to reason from Scripture. John Robbins brought up something in, in one of his lectures. It was, he, he said people get 
ticked off about this because they're like, well, this means I can't know anything about Chinese history. And he's like, so what? Right? Like, people are bothered by that. They're bothered that the things they thought they knew might not be true. It's like, you could apply that to a lot of stuff. But that doesn't mean you can't know anything because God gave us the history he wanted us to know. True history. Real history. That's, that's not wrong because we believe that God is, is real and that he's, he's the truth giver. Right? So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from on, on these things when I talk to people. And I don't necessarily push this. It's more the axiomatic part. When I start talking to people online about their starting points, you kind of take them back to this. And a lot of people will eventually agree, like, yes, I do have to start somewhere, and I can't prove that. And as long as you get people on that page, you're kind of good. Because then you're kind of talking as friends, and and then you just, I don't know. Because when people dogmatically just assert they know it, but they can prove it, but then they can't, it, it, it's humbling, I think, and it helps you just have a, a more productive conversation. That's just how I see it. Um, but the Christian foundation is Scripture. Uh, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. That's the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1. I'm not a creed guy. Never read the Westminster Confession other than this for the most part. This is great. Because this goes back to what we talked about in the first is logic, deducing from Scripture. So it's either set forth clearly or you can deduce certain truths from propositions in Scripture. And you can, there's a treasure trove. Like Travis said, it's a treasure trove. It's endless truth in there. And so what if Chinese history isn't in there? It's okay. It's okay not to know certain things. It's okay to say, I don't know. Um, I think a lot of us, people aren't comfortable with saying, I don't know. Um, and I've had to become more comfortable with that over the last few years, and I'm much more open now, and it's liberating, actually. It's liberating to be able to say to somebody, I don't know that. Here's my belief, here's my opinion, but can I prove X, Y, Z, or can I know it infallibly? No, and you can't either, you know? The only way to really know infallibly is if if the only infallible being tells you. Um, I think Paul kind of goes through both empiricism and rationalism in some of the things he says. But, he, I mean, he's knocking philosophy, you know. Where, where's the one who's wise or, or the scribes at the time? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? That's, they all sat around and debated, right? Um, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world, you know, whether you want to see that as philosophy or something to do with the Jews, either way. Um, it's not proper wisdom. And he says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, meaning you can't sit around and just argue, argue and make up arguments to know the God of the Scripture. You have to know him through how he's revealed himself, and you have to believe it. Um, It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to say those who believe. Jews demand signs. There's your empiricism. Show us a sign, right? And a wicked generation asks for a sign. People are doing that now. Christians all want signs. They want to see things. Uh, They want to see all this Hollywood stuff happen with with, uh, the end time stuff. They want to see. Um, And that's what the Jews wanted. They wanted signs, um, and Greeks wanted wisdom. You know, those were the philosophers of the time. Wisdom, but not true wisdom. Not wisdom that began with fear of the Lord. But, but you know, the, the gospel was foolish to, to the worldly, you know, to the worldly people with those philosophies. Um, anyway, but we know the verse. I wasn't going to finish it. Um, this was just an aside. I talked about presuppositionalism. Presuppositionalism just means you start by presupposing and assuming your starting point, and there's nothing wrong with it. Gordon Clark's on the left. Van Til's on the right. This is a big, in the Reformed world, this is like a big hubbub, big to-do. There was some big controversy. I don't know much about it, and I don't want to go there. Uh, I just want you to know that it exists out there. Um, Van Til, in my mind, was just a little off the, off the rails on a few things. But in general, I mean, both these men, I think, love the Lord. Um, but just to put it simply, this is, what John, this is from John Robbins. I thought this was awesome. You want a basic, bare-bones Christian philosophy. What's the Christian epistemology? The Bible tells me so. What's the Christian soteriology? mean salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall, be, you shall be saved. Metaphysics, how do things work? In God, in Him, we live and move and have our being. It's easy. Ethics, we ought to obey God rather than men. That, that is so simple. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with this from a standpoint of a secular person or an atheist coming up to you and, and trying to argue with you about why you believe what you believe. Because um, they do the same things. That's sort of the point. They, they cannot... Hold it against you that you're choosing your starting point when they do the same thing. Um, 
I think the modern battle now, and we talked about this in the first, um, the first one, was the irrationalism that's in the church. Um, you know, I called it a hatred of logic. There's actually a word for it. I'd forgotten to put that in there. Missology means hate, hatred of logic. There's actually a term for it. Uh, people hate logic. They want experience. They want feelings. Um, they'll turn the Bible into allegory, myth, some type of morality tale. Um, but I, I just think we need to stick with Scripture. Um, I don't know if you all ever read you know, Gary Crampton, but he has a lot of good things to say. I'm not going to read all these quotes. Um, but the fruit of the vine of secular philosophy, uh, I thought this was really good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with this because it is a quote I want to read. This is a book I would recommend reading. It was written, I believe, in the late 1800s by Robert Dabney. Um, the sensualistic philosophy of the 19th century is what it's called. And he's, he's going through and talking against empiricism of his time. And he goes through talking about John Locke, David Hume, all these people that push this stuff. And um, I wanted to read this because I thought it was good. Men often stigmatize metaphysical philosophy as shadowy and vague. Rightly so. They call it cloudland, contrasting instability of its positions with the practical and useful truths of physics as the fickle vapors are contrasted with the solid ground, meaning these people are saying physics is solid ground, it's real. Um, he said, let us accept the similitude for the moment. We are at once reminded that it is from this cloud land the most beneficent and the most destructive agencies descend, which bless or devastate the habitations of men, meaning worldly philosophies. Have a, they, they matter, and they, they penetrate into the world, and they wreak havoc. From those shifting clouds descends the genial rain which waters the earth, making it yield bread for the eater and seed for the sower. Thence also descends the mighty wind, which wrecks the costliest works of man and buries the mangled builder beneath his own ruins. Thence falls the thunderbolt, which in one instant dashes him to death. The philosophy of the infidels and sensualists of France was the storm cloud from which fell the ghastliest ruin witnessed in modern times. The reign of terror was the offspring of this philosophy. He was writing about French Revolution because that barbarism that came from that all started with these secular philosophies. Um, and so it's important to know those things so that you can see them when they're, they constantly happen. It's nothing new under the sun. None of these philosophies are new. They're mainly repackaged old Greek philosophies that are just repackaged and recycled in different ways. And so once you sort of see that, it's easy to, to at least talk about it and talk about it with fellow Christians. And so you recognize it and aren't sucked into some of these things that tickle the ears. Um, but a lot of people, you know, they, they want to be pragmatists about things. Um, I put this in there because people would reject truth because it, it hurts their wallet. It hurts their job. Um, and this was stated in Acts. Men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. He's saying, you know, we can't go there because, you know, we'll have to give up our trade uh, if we follow these other, other things. So there's always these ulterior motives, and greed is a huge one. Um, I thought this was just fun. I always look, like putting Neil deGrasse Tyson quotes in just because I, I don't like the guy. Um, Claiming there is no other life in the universe is like scooping up some water, looking at the cup, and claiming there are no whales in the ocean. I'm like, uh, Neil, what, first of all, we know what whales are. I know what a whale is, right? You're talking about things that nobody's ever seen. And then what's a universe? Define that, right? Like, define your terms. What does that mean? These, it's like they just don't think about it. Um, you know, and I, I'm going back to the Greg Bonson thing because he did write a book. I think, Bob, you, you probably know better than I. It was called By What Standard or something like that. Um, and this is such a great thing. I, I was reading through the end of Deuteronomy the other day, and this just stood out to me so much. You shall not have in your bag diverse, diverse weights, great and small. You shall not have in your house diverse measures, great and small. You should have a true and just weight and a true and just measure. The reason this stands out is it's not just applicable in this small context. This applies to everything in your life, meaning have a right standard by which you judge everything. Whether it's a morality claim, your Bible's your standard. That's your standard. Everything is measured against that. If somebody starts talking about science, you go, science has a standard. It's called the scientific method. Now you've got to hold, your, you hold their feet to the fire for it. And when they can't give it to you, you go, you're just making stuff up. Right? There's a standard for everything. Uh, a test, right? medical test, has to have a standard to know if it's accurate or not. Most of them don't. Okay? You want to start looking at polymerase chain reaction, PCR testing, all these things. There's no standard against which they measured these things. That's a problem. That's, it's not right. Um, age of the earth, all this nonsense. Oh, yeah, we tested this radiocarbon, whatever, isotope. And it's got a half-life of 5 billion years. Really? Did you sit around for 5 billion years and watch the half-life of something go down? 
And then you say you dated a rock to 13 billion years ago. Well, how did you validate that? Do you have a rock that you know is 13 billion years so you can check your test against it? No. They don't think about that stuff and they don't care, but we should, right? And that's why I thought this was awesome because this applies to so much more. And I, if I'm taking it out of context, that's fine because I think it's still a universal principle. I think having a proper standard for everything, and that's why you can ask people, especially when they make morality claims, you just ask them, by what standard are you making that claim? What is your standard for saying that, right or wrong? Whether it's a, you're talking to a vegan about something, if you're vegan, fine, whatever, but they'll start making up morality claims about the animals, and you go, how do you know that? How do you know it's, a, you know what I mean? Like, you can go down all these rabbit trails, and most of the time they don't know. It's a feeling, it's like, well, I just feel it. It's like, okay, that's fine. You can feel whatever you want, but you're talking about morality here. That's, that's a little different topic, so. Um, I'm going to sum up with that. These are some of the books I would recommend. Um, Gordon Clark, again, his stuff, if you want the best summary of other philosophies that you could ever read, uh, Thales to Dewey is probably one of the best books you could read. It's pretty heady, um, but it's really thorough. Um, I didn't put it on here, but John Frame has, I think it's a history of um, Western philosophy and theology, and it's that big. It's a really good book, too. Um, Epistemology on the, the second one, that's not a Christian book uh, by Bonjour, but it's highly recommended usually by Christian um, presuppositionalists to read. I, I, I bought it. It's, it's good. It goes into more of the Descartes stuff. Um, Logic by Isaac Watts was a, an older one that's supposed to be great. I haven't bought it yet, but I'm going to. Historiography, if you want to understand the problems around historical claims, um, Gordon Clark, again, an unbelievable book there. It just opens your mind to these things. And there's Dabney's book right there, The, the Sensualistic Philosophy of the 19th Century. It, it's really good. It's really wordy, like he wrote, you know, back when they really cared about grammar. Um, and so I'm reading it going, holy cow, it feels like you're reading Jonathan Edwards or something. Um, and then I did want to throw in the Bonson book there, which I haven't read, but I want to give kudos because I know he has great stuff. And Bob has told me, um, I haven't watched it yet, one of the best debates with an atheist. What, what was the atheist name? Yes, yeah, and there's, it's on YouTube, you can it's find it. YouTube. And it, it'd probably be worth watching, just so you can kind of see some of these principles play out and how, how you talk to people. Um, so, but that's all I got.